a story that I've been having a terrible time with, and uh, I think it's almost there. So I'm just going to read the, the beginning um, of it. It's called Sumi. Not as in, so Sumi. Sumi, like S-U-M-I. Okay, Sumi. Um, okay. The summer that Tak Leung turned 30, he was too preoccupied to celebrate. He just needed to find Sumi. He had questioned her people, hung around her old haunts, and every couple of weeks would pick over his apartment, once with a magnifying glass, in case he overlooked a clue she might have left. He had no idea what he would do if he found her. He slept badly and started passing late, humid hours stationed at his bedroom window in a wooden chair with thin, sloping armrests. By draping his forearms over the rests and barely moving, he found he could sit for long periods of time without getting uncomfortably hot or sweaty. He might have resembled a prisoner awaiting interrogation or execution, but he found that if he maintained enough composure, he would actually start to cool down. During those hours, he would observe two things. The well-lit street corner of Yatsu Lane, in case Sumi emerged from the shadows into its glow, and the new high-rise building, encased in bamboo scaffolding. For months, Tak had harbored a feeble sort of contempt towards it, not for the eyesore of the construction site, not for the noise, he was at the office during those times, but for what he knew was inevitable. It would deprive him of the view he'd become attached to over the years. The modest storefronts and cafes dotted along the tram line. Baylo Park, where seniors practiced Tai Chi in the morning and teenagers drank and flirted in the hot, airless evenings. During the Mid-Autumn Festival, the park teamed with children showing off their cartoon lanterns or crouching in picnic circles as they melted little red candles into the tarmac. Tack felt the 63-floor high-rise loom over them all, and worse, it seemed destined to remain empty amid rumors of municipal corruption and faulty construction. Tack didn't know why he stared at his windows night after night. Night after night they stared back, yielding no reply. Sometimes he wondered what clandestine life might exist behind its facade. Perhaps the illegals from the mainland had sneaked in with sleeping bags and camp stones, sharing their space with cockroaches, rats, and stray cats. Perhaps the squatters had hacked the doors off the hinges and smeared the walls with graffiti and piss. One could hope. But no sound was ever uttered, no light burned from within. Still, he stared into its glassy blankness, which sometimes rippled a certain way in the moonlight, reminding him of silk or a cold lake at midnight, and this would lull him softly into a cloud of half-sleep, where the images would flood in, as they always did. Her black hair cooled in the warm nape of her neck, a metal rectangle emblazoned with her name, a maze of bright, naked corridors. He'd met Sumi at a benefit thrown by Linda So, a friend he'd briefly dated at college. Linda had gone on to marry a successful property developer, but had stayed in touch, Tack assumed, because she liked to distinguish herself by collecting interesting people, while other socialites collected exotic pets or luxury handbags. Linda hosted a quarterly fundraiser at her apartment in support of various causes, which Tack regularly attended. The food was good, the apartment had a spectacular view of the central Wan Chai skyline, and there was a fleeting international flavor to these gatherings. Linda's guests often included reporters and NGO workers taking a break from disaster zones, renowned novelists in town for a speaking engagement, or film or theater producers courting investors for the next project which offered a novel change of scene whenever Tack grew restless with his own friends. As soon as he arrived at the party, Tack downed several shots of Berlin in swift succession and slinked through the apartment in reconnaissance mode, scanning the crowd for interesting new faces or familiar friendly ones. He skirted past the group of couples in the foyer, picking at their canapes while recounting vacation or investment stories. He nodded hello at the lithe blonde woman leaving the hallway bathroom, a Swiss photojournalist he'd met a few parties ago, 
and then ducked out of view when he remembered that she turned out to be a peculiarly specific racist. <laughs> she had admitted after sex to relief upon learning that he was Chinese, not Vietnamese, which she deemed generally untrustworthy. In the living room, Tak noted how oddly the guests stood in pairs or groups of three and four, four cradling their glasses and nodding their heads to the music with a hazy diligence or glanced furtively around the room for better prospects. Tack recognized the music, Nina Simone's song, he thought, but he couldn't place the name. Over by the balcony windows against a glassy backdrop of dark, leaning skyscrapers, a young woman swayed discreetly to the music. With languorous, barely moving lips, she appeared to be mouthing the lyrics to the song. She looked somewhat out of place standing by herself and wearing a grey office managery pantsuit that did her no favours. But she seemed entirely at ease with her own company. Her dark eyes gazed ahead into some middle distance towards what Hack assumed to be some private imagined destination where a much more interesting party was probably taking place. As he moved closer, he noted her deep tan, the splash of freckles on her sharp, feline cheeks, and then her neck, which was slim and muscular. Wisps of hair that had slipped out from her bun tickled the side of her nose. Tack went to scratch his own nose, and in the moment of this slight involuntary gesture, the woman appeared to have been alerted to his presence. Her smile had an amused, mildly unsettling vagueness to it. The corner of her lips barely curled, but there was a forceful kind of warmth in her eyes which seemed to look directly into him, beyond the surface layer of skin, eyes, hair. Tack became conscious of a warm spot on the back of his neck. At a loss for words, he found himself pointing at her pantsuit. Did you just come from work? She regarded her outfit in a detached sort of way, as if she'd forgotten she was wearing it. Job interview, she said. Normally I work in a bank. But you, let's see. She cocked her head. Dark jeans, hmm, expensive looking t-shirt. Geometric shapes, but no logo. Nicely messy hair. You seem like a creative type. Designer? Artist, corrected Tap, regretting instantly how pretentious he sounded. Uh, sort of. An artist, sort of, she mused. What do you make, paintings, sculptures? A waiter circulating with a tray of canapes approached them. She took a crab puff from him and popped it in her mouth. I should really say I'm a concept artist, said Tack. He noticed how eager he was to explain himself to her. Basically, I draw environments for films, mountains, castles, the inside of spaceships, that kind of thing. As she chewed, the woman nodded emphatically to show her understanding. Tack noticed two small vertical creases formed between her eyebrows as she stopped to think about something. There's a specific word, isn't there, for someone who draws? Draftsman. That's it. You must be a pretty good draftsman to do that kind of work. Well, it's not brain surgery, but I suppose not everyone can do it. It takes training, the woman nodded. Did you go to art school? In America, said Tack. San Francisco. San Francisco, the woman repeated slowly as, she, as if she were contemplating a trip there. I'm sure I'd have seen your work if I ever went to the cinema. Movies aren't for everyone, Tack shrugged. She shook her head. Movies I like, but cinemas. Don't you find it odd to sit in a dark room with strangers for two hours? Well, I suppose it is a bit strange when we put it like that, mused Tack. But there's something about doing an activity with other people, don't you think? A sense of, I don't know, being together? Well, it's not together, really, is it? Nobody acknowledges each other unless they're telling someone to be quiet to get off their phone. Mm. I see the two of you have met. Linda Stowe was edging her way through the party with a full glass of white wine in one hand and a stack of donation envelopes in the other. Sumi, you seem well. Thanks, Linda, great cause. Linda gave a tight smile and turned to Tack with a sudden look of concern. How are you? I hope everything went all right with your father's funeral. Did you get my flowers? <laughs> it went fine, Linda. Thanks, the tech. Sorry to miss your party. Um, heard it was quite an event. Mr. Big from Sex in the City came by, she beamed. 
He played very well. And he loved the deconstructed bars. Now, don't forget to sign up for the silent auction at the end of the night. Promise? She kissed the air on either side of his head, squeezed his shoulder absently, and went on her way. So, this benefit, said Tack. What is the cause? Hmm, Paris? No, that was last time, I think. Orphans? No, that's not it. She doesn't seem to like you very much. Linda? Well, you can't really blame her, given my relationship with her husband. She smiled and shook her head. It's not, it's not what you think. I'm from the same ancestral village as him. He's my second or third cousin on my dad's side. And then, you know, got out of him a big shop property tycoon. The first land to really make it. He probably sent half the kids in the village to university. There's even a street named after him. Linda doesn't like him helping his poor relatives. But I think we're just as cute as orphans or endangered species. <laughs> Sumi Lamb, said Tack. He saw her name together. Yes? Do you want to get out of here, Sumi Lamb? I'll get my coat. Several things we learned about Sumi over the next few weeks. She lived with her widowed aunt up in the New Territories. She liked jazz, and she wasn't enthusiastic about planning or going out. Instead, several times a week, she called him just as she was leaving work and asked if she could jump on the tram to his place. He found that he couldn't say no, even if he had to cancel plans to see her, and became accustomed to coming home to find her stationed in the lobby of his building, holding a bag of takeout and chatting up Uncle Mo, the security guard. As soon as they stepped foot inside the apartment, Sunni liked to get out of her bank teller uniform, black heels, a grey linen skirt, and a white blouse with a metal name badge, S. Lamb, pinned to the breast pocket that she would carefully remove and place on the third shelf of the bookcase. She would slip into one of Tack's t-shirts and unpack the takeout boxes while he opened a cold beer or a bottle of wine. Most evenings they would listen to a jazz CD she brought over, eat picnic style on the living room floor, talk, have sex in his room and fall asleep. Sumi had a sharp, curious mind and he was struck by her detailed knowledge of diverse subjects that included adolescent psychology, edible plants, and the history of Cantonese opera. Uncle Mo is such an interesting guy, she said one evening. Did you know he used to be a movie extra in the 60s? He did the Cantonese opera circuit as a kid, but in the movies I never let him sing. Once, though, he had a scene with Yang Kim Fei in the Peony Pavilion. Oh, this is a good one. She reached across the floor for the remote control, nudging the edge of a beer bottle with her knee. Pat caught it before it toppled and swept it out of her path. Mingus, Tokyo, 1976, she said, turning up the volume. Everything's stripped down, just a quintet. Who's Yang Kim Hei? Yang Kim Fei, canto opera legend. And how come you know so much about Cantonese opera? I thought there was a law against people under 65 listening to that. Tack's parents had played those songs when he was a child, and whenever he heard those sharp, pinched, mournful voices, he would run into his room with his hands over his ears. Well, I took some lessons when I was a kid, but I'm not into it so much these days. She shrugged. My aunt still plays it every morning. It always sounds to me like a cat falling off a building. Well, you get used to it after a while. Sumi smiled and stifled a yawn. It's like sleeping through a really long alarm. <laughs> she closed her eyes, and for a while they just sat and listened to the music, their backs resting against the seat of the sofa. At the end of the song, her eyes were still closed. Tack turned off the stereo, took her hands, which were still cold from the beer, and gently pulled her to her feet. He guided her by the shoulders to the bedroom, where she draped herself over the edge of the bed, her left arm hanging limp over the side. Seeing the precariousness of her position, he attempted to lift her without disturbing her and move her closer towards the middle of the bed. He was surprised by the weight and heat of her limbs. I'm not to sleep, she murmured, taking his hand and laying it on her breast. Then her breathing became deep and content, and it was clear that she'd fallen asleep again. She must have had a tiring day or not enough sleep the night before, Tack thought. He sat in the chair facing the bed, and for a short while, he indulged in the novelty of watching her. He noticed the softening in the contours of her face and that her usual watchfulness had given way to an unguarded, childlike quality. 
Something in the deep rise and fall of her shoulders reminded him of an animal, a tiger perhaps, relishing sleep after the exhaustion of a hunt or of defending its territory. She was usually gone by the time he'd woken up. He would find no note, only the t-shirt she'd worn the night before, neatly folded on the kitchen counter. Once, he gave the t-shirt a sniff before putting it back in his room. It smelled of cucumber soap and laundry detergent, and there was a hint of the food they'd had the night before. But it was hard to detect any scent that seemed to belong to Sumi. And we go on from there. Thank you so much. <laughs>